asking for good to go, Dr. Albert Hernandez. Thank you. Well, hello again. Hello. So um, I will make sure that I'm more mindful of the time this time, and we will take a break at 7.30, okay? So uh, an hour in, and we'll take about a 10-minute break, and I will start at 10 after 7, regardless of whether you're back or not. So, oh, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, so, wow, 740, yeah, yeah, huh. No, 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 yeah, and time doesn't exist anyway, it's an illusion according to the philosophers. All right, um, so, we talked last week very broadly about medievalism and romantic medievalism, and I just want to do a quick review for the benefit of anyone who was not here last week. Romantic medievalism is a, an artistic and entertainment trend in popular culture that started in the 1830s. Uh, it involved um, outrageous things such as building parks in England, in France, in some parts of the United States, so it was more of a European phenomenon. Parks that were designed to look like medieval ruins. Okay, a ruined church, a ruined castle, and so forth. Also in the 1800s, especially in the late 1800s and early 1900s, all the way up to World War II, grail societies and societies based on different versions of chivalry and of knighthood began proliferating in the European world, in the United States, and also in Central and South America, and in Australia. Any place where the Western powers had colonized and had brought their culture with them, me romantic medievalism took root. Um, some of that is very unrealistic, okay? It was for more than just entertainment purposes. It was this naive notion that somehow the world was gentler, kinder, cleaner, more innocent in the Middle Ages. And of course, that's not what the Middle Ages were, right? It was an incredibly violent world a world where people still believed that in order to heal from certain illnesses, you had to bleed people, uh, in some cases for hours, and sometimes for three or four days repeatedly. It was a world where we were still burning people at the stake for being heretics, witches, sorcerers, even scientists. Because to the medieval mind, a scientist was a wizard. Okay? Um... And so, romantic medievalism, one of the things that romantic, medievalism's, romantic medievalism gives us is the cult of Joan of Arc. And I really mean it when I say a cult, because from the late 1800s to the mid-1900s, and probably even still today, there was an entire industry, and I mean that intentionally, an industry that grew up around the person and the story and the mythology of Joan of Arc in ways that we lose sight then of the real Joan of Arc, okay? And you might say that it also appealed to modern women in the late 1800s and early 1900s who were interested in women's rights, feminism, um, uh, acquiring voting rights uh, for women, and so forth, okay? Uh, this is uh, an image from a Hollywood version. Uh, every few years, Hollywood makes a new movie of Joan of Arc, uh, the most recent one was probably less than 10 years ago. Sometimes two or three appear within a short span of time because each producer is hoping to capitalize on the success of the other producer. And I've got to be honest with you, the last few Joan of Arc movies haven't done very well at the box office. Maybe, and I hope I don't offend anyone, maybe it's because Joan of Arc is just not, and here's the potential offense, maybe it's simply because Joan of Arc is just not badass enough. Okay? <laughs> Because if you look at the female heroines in the most recent medieval portrayals of female warriors, they are some really, really tough and vicious women, okay? But also very much in command and control of their agency as female leaders and female rulers. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight because these female characters in contemporary medievalism, contemporary romantic medievalism, have a particular affinity with dragons, okay? That's not in the historical record. That's not even the medieval mythology, but Hollywood is having a lot of fun with this nowadays, and I believe we'll continue to have a lot of fun with it. Um, so again, 
romantic medievalism. I'd say romantic medievalism might be over by now, but now we're in a different phase that we just refer to as medievalism. And medievalism is, again, the use of symbols, tropes. You all know what a trope is, a particular phrase or slogan or even an image that keeps showing up in popular culture and in literature. So, again, symbols, tropes, words, images, artwork, I mean, you name it, even songs that, that uh, manifest in popular culture but are borrowed from the Middle Ages. And the people borrowing do not care about historical accuracy. Sometimes they do, such as in the uh, Game of Thrones series, how realistic the battle scenes were. Incredibly realistic, viciously realistic. And other times, they really don't care. Of course, Game of Thrones did not need to be historically accurate because it was based on a make-believe world that existed somewhere in the distant past, even thousands of years ago, possibly. Okay? There's a new movie out called The Last Duel with uh, Ben Affleck and... Oh, gosh, I forgot the other guy. And Matt Damon. Okay? Read the book. Yes, the, read the book. It is an excellent uh, historical novel. And I, again, I need to be honest with you, tremendous accuracy in that particular movie and in the book. However, there are a few things that are portrayed in the movie that have nothing to do with the Middle Ages. It's sort of Hollywood fluff um, to appeal to today's audiences. Uh, there's too much sex. Far more sex than in the Middle Ages, okay? Um, the character of Ben Affleck it appears too modern, even the way he dyes his hair, uh, the way he relates to his friends, a little too modern. However, the battle scenes are incredibly accurate, okay? Everywhere from the costuming to the armor to the way the horses move um, to the injuries, which are vicious injuries, um, and I would say, you know, let's not lose sight of the fact that it's based on an actual story from the Middle Ages about a woman who brings charges of rape against a high-ranking lord. And then her husband is in the predicament of deciding how to respond to that. I won't say any more because it could be a spoiler alert, okay? Uh, it might get nominated for costuming, seriously. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it did. It won't get nominated for the acting, though. Um, <laughs> although maybe the woman might get nominated, you know, the, the female character. Um, she steals the show. Uh, and in many ways, it becomes a story about her and her voice and her agency. And that is actually from an actual legal case in the Middle Ages. And it's called The Last Duel because it was a moment in which the French monarchy had outlawed dueling, okay? Which before was as common as uh, modern day people going to the gym, okay? Uh, it was supposed to be for sport, dueling, you know, jousting, but sometimes people got carried away and actually ended up injuring each other and, and uh, injuring each other for life or killing each other. Uh, so anyway, all right, so that's a quick review. And then last week I teased you constantly by talking to you about the fake Middle Ages and the real Middle Ages. I'm not gonna do that so much tonight. Okay, but again, there is a real Middle Ages, and I see some of you still have your handout from last week. The real Middle Ages probably started around, oh, let's say in the Dark Ages after the fall of the Roman Empire. Notice I refuse to pin down a date. There's something medieval that already exists by the year 550. Um, there's something very medieval that already exists by the year 800 in Europe. And when did the Middle Ages end? Well, some people would say in the 1650s. Others would say no, in the early 1700s. s So there is something medieval that is still alive and well in the late 1600s. Uh, but whatever medieval the, the real Middle Ages were, I'm pretty sure they're over by the 1720s or 1730s, which takes us to the lifetime of John Wesley and Charles Wesley and that entire family. Okay? So, yeah, imagine that. Uh, as I said last week, the last person burned at the stake 
if we think of that as, as an example of medieval, you know, wackiness, evil, cruelty, the last person burned at the stake was burned in Scotland in 1697. Okay, and 1697 was yesterday. Most of us could trace our family heritage back to 1697 if we had the resources and the money to do it. It's not always uh, a simple trick of going online and tracing your, your last name. It's much, much more complicated than that. Anyway, so tonight I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the mythologies of the Middle Ages which are really born during the Dark Ages, okay? And the Dark Ages, we believe, lasted from 476 of the Common Era. I could argue and debate that date. I'll give you an example in a moment. To around the year 800. And I could argue and debate that, that date too. This is the traditional dating for the Dark Ages. And they were dark because of the collapse of ancient civilization, of the entire ancient civilization. The only comparable event that we could have in our time would be a nuclear war or a rock the size of Manhattan Island hitting the earth somewhere. And we would plunge into our own dark ages. Okay? However, we know that the Roman Empire did not completely fall apart in 476. We know that 50 years later, the Roman Empire was still alive and relatively well. Okay? And there were visions and dreams and hopes of reestablishing it. Civilization is a very thin veneer. You know what I mean by a very thin veneer? You know, you have, you have any nice furniture at home and you tell people, oh, no, 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 don't throw your keys on that, on that credenza. Don't throw your keys on the dining room table. A veneer is a fragile thing. You know, that, that polish, that shine that we have on fine furniture. That's what I tell students civilization is. Very fragile. All the things that we take for granted. Power, clean water, running water, you know, food in the supermarkets for those of us who live in cities and towns and have no idea how to grow our own food. We'd die if the supermarket, most of us would die if the supermarkets disappeared. Think about that. Sorry, I didn't mean to make you all get so serious. But this is the truth of what happened to that world. Eventually, the cities of the Roman Empire became the most unsafe places in which to live. Because since city dwellers don't know a lot of this basic knowledge, they start preying on each other. Okay? And so anyone who had an ounce of awareness headed to the hills, to the countryside. You've heard the phrase, head for the hills. It comes from the collapse of the, of the ancient world. But again, make no mistake about it, for about 50 years, and I would say for 60 years, from 476 to about 535, the Roman Empire was still functioning. Taxes were being collected. Markets were open. Supermarkets were open. Okay? There was a protective force. There were schools where people learned how to read and write. The water was running. And then something happened. Now, the 19th century... The historians who gave us the modern historical profession in the 1800s, okay, remember what I told you last week, the historical profession, modern historical profession that I represent has only been around since the 1850s, okay? Before that, everyone I can safely say was an amateur historian. Starting in the 1850s, German scholars and French scholars got the brilliant idea of combining scientific principles scientific methods with historical study, with historical analysis. Many people who worked as historians prior to 1850, prior to 1855, couldn't get a job today as a historian, couldn't even get their books published if they were around today, because they did not follow modern, empirical, scientific, evidence-based historical research, okay? We know, here's an example, we know that the First Crusade occurred in November of 1095 when Pope Urban II preached about how the Holy Land had been conquered by the infidels. His word, not mine. The Muslims, the Arabs, the Saracens. Okay? And we don't really know what he said in that sermon. We really don't. 
Yet everywhere you look, in every encyclopedia, and every Wikipedia entry on the planet, regardless of the Wikipedia language, it, it claims to know. The truth is we do not know. Because the first accounts that were ever written of Pope Urban II's infamous sermon preaching the First Crusade were written down 20 years and more after November of 1095. Okay, And if I have problems remembering things from this morning or from a week ago, imagine remembering across 20 years a sermon that you heard in public, if you were there, and some of these chroniclers were not even present, okay, that you heard in public without modern acoustical enhancement stuff, you know, microphones, speakers, uh, and then trying to remember that. So, so there you have an example of the challenges that a historian confronts, okay? Regardless of, regardless of romantic medievalism and medievalism. Maybe these things only complicate matters for modern day professional historians. Because when you go to teach um, the history of the Middle Ages in, in college or in high school or in a graduate program like I teach, people already have the story of the past as filtered through romantic medievalism or contemporary medievalism, okay? Here, I'll give you something else to look at for a few minutes. This is a Templar knight uh, battling with an Arab knight, also known as the Saracens, even though that's an example of European ignorance. They were not all Saracens. Some of them didn't even know what a Saracen was and yet they, called, they got called Saracens. That's okay, the, uh, the Arab and Muslim side didn't know what the Europeans were, so they called them all Frank, Franjoy, which means Franks, even though eventually the Franks were only a small fraction of the Crusader uh, forces. Um, but anyway, so you get the idea that history in some ways is a myth that we choose to believe, okay? Even the history books that I've written may end up on the Aufhebungen of history 200 years from now. You all know what the, uh, anyone of German ancestry in the room, Aufhebungen, literally pile of manure. <laughs> Think about that, okay? Think about that because in a way that's what happened with much of the historical work of the period from the 1850s and even the period before that, okay? You should see the incredibly horrific unexamined assumptions that exist in history books written a hundred years ago, a hundred and fifty years ago, a hundred and sixty, two hundred years ago. And, and, and I tell students that the more I study and the more I teach and the more I learn, the humbler I become. Because I am sure that there are things that I have written about that a hundred years from now, two hundred years from now, someone's going to say, wow, that guy Hernandez was delusional. And they will say that because history is about the present. It's not about the past. Oh, I just disappointed some of you. History is about the present. It's not really about the past. Because every generation of historians looks to the past with present day agendas and present day questions. And those questions and those agendas are gonna change every 25 to 35 years. Because that is the length of an academic career. That is a, the length of a scholarly career. The same thing happens in the sciences. The same thing happens in theology, in ethics, and in other fields of study. Each new generation of university scholars and researchers, whether they're at an academic institution or they're purely at a research institution, is going to want to forge their own resumes, their own CVs, their own professional identities. And sometimes we do it off of the blind spots, listen carefully, off of the blind spots that we find in an earlier generation's work and writings. But those blind spots are the most powerful thing that drive an academic career. I tell my PhD students at ILF and at DU who are specializing or want to specialize in historical studies, I say to them, look for the blind spots, look for the gaps. Look for the gaps and the blind spots in the historical record and then exploit that gap, exploit that blind spot. Ask yourself, why is there this ignorance 
in the historical record? Why is there this blindness to this particular thing in the historical record? And then you need to take a step back at some point and ask yourself, and how are my own blind spots, my own prejudices, my own lenses affecting my knowledge or my understanding of this material from 500 years ago, 700 years ago, 1,000 years ago, okay? So does that give you a sense of how historians work? And because there is so much material to organize, so much material to organize, modern historians have begun inventing periods. Back, again, back in the 1850s, periods. Uh, even though I just told you that from 476 to about 535, the ancient world had not yet entered the Dark Ages. And I am willing to put my professional integrity on that. The ancient world had not yet entered the Dark Ages. I believe if the Dark Ages have something to do with the real collapse of civilization and the loss of, 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 of basic language skills, reading, writing, um, the loss of libraries, the loss of knowledge of basic mathematics and geometry, then we have to look at the period right after 535 of the Common Era, or AD for those of you who are familiar with the old dating system. Okay? Um, and we used to blame the barbarians for the fall of the ancient world. We no longer believe that. Okay? I certainly don't. I think that's just ridiculous garbage. The barbarians, do you know who I'm talking about when I say the barbarians? The Goths. The Goths? Others? Were those the Germanic tribes? The Germanic tribes, exactly. The Goths, the Burgundians, the Vandals, the Scandinavian tribes as well. You know, the Danes, um, the Rus, the Russians. Uh, the Rus, uh, Russians were a Viking tribe. And we could go on and on with examples of that, right? The Franks, the Vandals, you know what they did? They vandalized. So the word vandalism comes from one of the tribes that overran the Roman Empire. Uh, however, that's not what the barbarians believed about the Roman Empire. They were in awe of it. And all that they wanted was a slice of Roman citizenship and all the benefits that came with Roman citizenship. But the empire was overstretched and the imperial treasury was low. And the empire that had, been, that had grown through war and by accepting people from all over the world eventually started building walls on its borders. Seriously. And see, some of you are smiling because you're thinking, oh, we're doing that. Yeah, no great nation has ever survived wall building. China, maybe, but no other great nation or empire has ever survived that. And they were trying to keep out many of your ancestors and mine. Okay? So 2,000 years ago, well, really, 15 centuries ago, um, white people were the enemies of civilization. The Romans, I don't consider them white. I really don't. And if you're uncomfortable because I'm going to talk about race, get used to it. Because medievalism is about the creation of racialization. Most modern race theories come out of our medieval delusions about the past. As I told you last week, when the modern nation states were being born, were being created, in the 1700s, the 1800s, and the, in the early 1900s, every modern nationalistic theorist wanted to find a glorious heritage, a glorious past in the Middle Ages, with the exception of the United States. The you know, US imperialism manifest destiny is slightly different, but all the Europeans were looking for some glorious chapter in the Middle Ages that they could anchor French identity, German identity, Spanish identity, Dutch identity, Italian identity. And I could go on and on and on and on. There's a famous book about this. It's called The Myth of Nations, okay? The Origins of Modern Europe uh, by a very well-known historian um, who, who um, has written a lot about that subject. And right now his name eludes me. Yeah. So Rome had the wall, but why exactly did it fall? Rome fell perhaps because it was too big and maybe you could say it never really fell. You could say that in moving the capital city to Byzantium and renaming it Constantinople, um, the Roman Empire survived for another thousand years. Um, 
maybe the myth of the fall of Rome is a European delusion so that modern Germany, modern France, modern Italy, see, do you get the, see the pattern? Could claim we are bringing back the glories of Rome with our modern civilization. Look at these roads that we're building, like the Roman emperors built roads. Look at Washington, D.C. It's like a miniature Rome. Um, do, do you see how this plays out? Downtown everywhere in the Western world looks like a mini Rome or a mini Athens. And it's part of that, that myth, that romanticizing of the past. Uh, I'm not talking about romantic uh, antiquity. We did romanticize antiquity as well, uh, which gives us Monticello and Washington, D.C., and I would say even our own Capitol building in downtown Denver, uh, which is based on a Roman temple, okay? The turret, I mean, the, the dome especially. And quite frankly, the facade, the facade as well. Um, so yeah, maybe we could argue that the Roman Empire never fell at all, that it survived in the East, and the East has multiple golden ages of its own over a thousand years until the fall of Byzantium in the year 1453 at the hands of the Ottoman Turks. And it doesn't really fall very easily because the walls were 13 feet thick and it's only the invention of the cannon that allows the Turks and other regional tribes to bring down the mighty empire of Byzantium, which was regarded as the Eastern Roman Empire. We may call it Byzantium, but to them, they were the Eastern Roman Empire. And in their history books, they had an unbroken line of succession from the first Roman emperors way back in Rome to the most recent Byzantine emperors in Constantinople. So yeah, thank you for asking that. So, something that is very, very dark does set in by the year 535. I'll say something a little bit very briefly about that. The year 800 is another, it's another politicized cultural and mythological marker. The year 800 is the traditional year in which the Pope crowned Charlemagne as the king of the Franks. Christmas Day, I believe it was, to be symbolic, okay? And put a crown on his head, a Germanic Frankish chieftain warlord who had barely mastered the skill of reading and writing. Put a crown on his head and called him Holy Roman Emperor. And if, as I say all the time, jokingly and sarcastically, but not mean-spiritedly, it was neither Roman nor holy nor an empire, which Charlemagne governed over. And Charlemagne's biggest frustration was the inability to find clergy who could read and write, believe it or not, and civil servants who could read and write and do basic math to collect taxes and to create laws and wills and, and written, written uh, contracts, okay, written contracts. What a predicament, what a mess. But notice that the church in the year 800 did remember the glories of the past, the wonders of the past. And the church still held in the back of its mind the possibility, if we can pacify these barbarians, if we can convert them to Christianity, if we can teach them to read and write, if we can teach them to follow the sacraments, maybe there's hope to rebuild civilization. Because in the year 800, it was still incredibly unsafe to travel from town to town or from city to city. Many of the cities still lay in ruins, and there were Roman ruins everywhere. And the educated who understood a thing or two about the past, because maybe they could read, were often depressed, saying, look at that. Who built that? And why can't we build it? Why don't we know how to build it? And in some cases, again, it would be a thousand years before Europeans would start rebuilding things of that magnitude, things of that stature things of that complexity, okay? So, so, as I tell students now, the Dark Ages probably ended around the year 950 when the royal families of these Germanic warlords and chieftains had acquired enough military savvy to actually defeat the Vikings with the help of the church who converted the Vikings. And this relates directly to medievalism 
because in the last eight years, popular culture has become obsessed with the Vikings. They're like four different series on, on cable and on regular TV. There's books, there's comic books, okay? The dressing up as a Viking is really big this Halloween, but it has been for like the last seven or eight Halloweens, okay? And again, the Hollywood portrayal of the Vikings is inspiring to a lot of people who are of uh, Scandinavian or Viking heritage, but only one of those shows, in my opinion, portrays the Vikings as they were. I love it because it portrays them dirty. Their fingernails are so filthy that I'd be like, well, don't touch me. Which you know. I believe it's uh, Vikings. Sorry? It's on the History Channel. Yes, on the, thank you. The one on the History Channel. I'm actually watching it with my son right now. So, yeah. I, I, I watched all of it with my late father-in-law until he passed. He really That's loved it. <laughs> yeah, it's really quite incredible. Even the way the women are portrayed, because many people don't realize this, they think of the Vikings as these incredible macho warriors, but in Viking society, not, again, I, I can't generalize, because there's dozens of different Viking tribes from different parts of Northern Europe and Scandinavia, but in many of the tribes, property was transferred through the female line. And so who your mother was happened to be very important especially if you came from one of the uh, higher-ranking clans among the Vikings, okay? So the Vikings terrorized Europe after the centralization that Charlemagne was able to pull off. And the, the, the terror was for all of the coastal cities. Viking ships were very fast. The Vikings were incredibly cohesive as a military unit. Um, they were ruthless. And uh, they could attack in the middle of the night or in, in broad daylight. And they figured out not only how to attack by sea, even with stealth in the middle of the night, but also how to attack by river. Um, they reached the gates of Byzantium. And there are recounts of Viking raiding naval parties trying to attack Byzantium. Futile, right? because of what I said about the walls of Constantinople. But notice that they made it all the way <coughs> from the North Sea to um, the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, just simply by following the rivers through Central Europe. I mean, the fact that they could care to even try is kind of evidence of their ferocity. Yes, right? I mean, really, think about that. In, a, in an era when most people wouldn't dare of venturing too far from where they lived, the Vikings traveled thousands of miles across Central Europe uh, to the gates of Byzantium. And don't forget, because we keep revising the history of North America, they came to the so-called New World. We now believe they came as early as the year 1092. This is just fresh off the press. You can Google it if you want later on. There's even an interesting little video on YouTube about it, or maybe not YouTube, but one of the news services. 1092, okay? Some believe it was actually in the late 900s. Um, and there are settlements in Newfoundland and in other parts of the Canadian coast where it is believed there were Viking settlements. Implements have been found. Uh, uh, dwellings have been found. Okay, coins have been found. Armor has been found. Or rather, the remnants of armor. Chain mail has been found. Uh, we believe they may have made it as far inland as Michigan and Minnesota, and we believe that they have, may have made it as far south as southern Massachusetts. Okay? So there's another chapter of the history of humanity that is constantly being revised because of new archaeological and historical evidence. And for people of Scandinavian descent, this will be a very meaningful tidbit of personal heritage, really, you know? After all, no one likes the Spanish conquistadors, not even my family who are descendants of Spanish conquistadors. Do you see how this plays out? So if you're an American of Viking heritage, of Viking lineage, oh, you could have a lot of fun with this. Think about that. You could say, yeah, you English bleepin' bleepin' bleeps, <laughs> you know, you Spaniards, See? And you could even say, and my ancestors did not rape the land. 
And my ancestors did not ravage the Indians or their women. Because we have evidence that the Vikings got along pretty well with the locals, with the natives. There is some archaeological evidence to that effect. And there are oral traditions and oral study, oral stories um, passed down by word of mouth, even among certain Native American communities. Okay? One, I believe, is about a horned... Uh, a horned visitor that came from across the sea with a very big, thick beard. Get it? Anyway. Of course, some historians want to just write this off. Oh, that's, that's, a, later, that's a later development. They probably learned that from the colonists in the 1600s or the 1700s. Or maybe some Native American person got their hands on a, on a book or... But come on, there's always a little bit of truth to every legend and every story, a little bit. Sometimes there's a little bit more and sometimes there's very, very, very little. So there you have a, a little bit of how the real Middle Ages and our ongoing fascination with these mythologies, these legends from the past continue to influence us right down to today in the year 2021, okay? So, if you will allow me a tangent, because I think for those of you who went to school many, many, many years ago, that this will just be very fascinating, and I'm becoming increasingly interested in this, okay? So, as a historian, um, mainly of the Middle Ages, I was always fascinated and a little bit bothered by how the archaeological record of late ancient civilization and of the early Middle Ages just kind of fell off around the 535 horizon, okay? Um, and I always wondered, boy, that's kind of weird. Uh, where'd everybody go? Why did the cities empty out? Why does ancient civilization fall apart around the year 535? Uh, some would say the actual date is 536. Others would say it's a 10-year period from 535 545, okay? We knew some of it, but we didn't know all of it. We knew that the Byzantine Empire had been ravaged by bubonic plague at that same moment, a plague as devastating as the Black Death of the Middle Ages. And as I told you last week, the Black Death of the Middle Ages wiped out the medieval world, okay? On the other side of the Black Death, in Europe, there's a very different civilization. It, it probably sets off the Reformation, it definitely encourages and, and empowers the Renaissance, and it empowers all kinds of revolutions, economic revolutions, political revolutions, social revolutions, because people eventually just get fed up from all the suffering due to the Black Death and the incapacity of the church and the governments to improve life in any way, shape, in any significant way, shape, or form. Okay? And that the church persecutes the first scientists only encouraged more enmity among the public later on against religious institutions in favor of science. Need I say more? Okay. So that's going on in this time period, what I call that event horizon from 535 to about 545. But then something else has turned up in the, histor in the geological record. And we've only been studying this since about 1998, 1999. Because in the early 90s, uh, paleontologists began theorizing that there was a mass extinction of dinosaurs. Okay, you've heard about that? The great big rock that killed off the dinosaurs? Okay, about 66 million years ago. And people in other fields started speculating, well, listen, if, if, if that humongous rock hit the earth 66 million years ago, then this has happened before, and it's going to happen again in the future. What if we started looking for these signatures of celestial impacts in other time periods and in other places? And sure enough, we've now found, you know, the history of the earth, the geologic history of the earth, and the geological, no, the biological history of life on, on this planet has been dramatically altered a number of times by celestial impacts, okay? It can be a meteorite, but it can also be a comet. And a comet is far more devastating because the comet usually explodes in the atmosphere 
and it explodes with the force of sometimes 100 nuclear weapons. Exploding in the atmosphere is actually worse than hitting the ground. And most modern-day nuclear weapons are designed to explode in the atmosphere and not on the ground. I know, we're so diabolical. Seriously. I hope I'm not offending you. This is all true. So, the search was on. What really brought about the end of the Roman Empire? And some historians and some scholars were saying, hey, did you read that chronicle by that monk that everyone said was just delusional and wasn't even true? That monk that said that he crossed in a boat from the British Isles over to Normandy, to France, and that he walked for days and all he saw was dead trees and he said that it was raining ash? And someone said, hey, you know what? We've known of that account for a long, long time, but no one has ever taken it seriously. I mean, some people wrote it off as a monastic delusion about the end of the world. Well, maybe we should never have written it off because geologists teamed up with historians and archaeologists in the late 1990s, following all of that information about the dinosaurs, and started looking at all kinds of things in Europe and the Mediterranean. And they came to the conclusion, they spent years looking for a celestial impact, meaning a comet or a meteorite, and they couldn't find it. So then they said, well, maybe it was a supervolcano. A supervolcano can alter civilization, and it can alter life on Earth. And, and in looking for a supervolcano, they found three possibilities. Three, not just two, but three. There's also a video of this on YouTube or somewhere online if you want to look at it later on. Okay, So think about this. Um, there are now three possible volcanoes. And when I started studying this, there was only one possible volcano. Now there are three, all of which erupted at the event horizon of 536. No, excuse me, 535 to 538. Okay, with two of them, we're 99% sure erupting in the year 536. Imagine that. Three super volcanoes spewing ash into the northern hemisphere is enough to kill off an agricultural civilization like the Roman Empire was. Or to cause massive famine, massive disruption, maybe even exacerbating things from all the decaying biological matter to actually produce ex and exacerbate the Black Death, or I should say bubonic plague. Let me not call it the Black Death because that's from the Middle Ages. Think about this, okay? Maybe we've been incredibly arrogant about the past, thinking, oh, oh pff, we're, 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 we're invincible. No, we're not. We're really fragile, as the pandemic of the last 20 months, or 21 months by now, shows us. Well, soon to be 21 months. Sorry, I've, I've lost track of time from the incredible amount of time that I've been teaching on Zoom from my place. Um, so think about this. The, the, the historians and the archaeologists of the 1800s and the early 1900s were mostly European and American men in a culture that was very warlike, the culture that gave us World War I and World War II, okay? Okay. And they truly believed that somehow the barbarians, many of your ancestors, ancestors and mine, had killed off civilization. And that may be absolutely false, or maybe just a tiny bit true. A tiny bit true. Wow. The history books haven't been changed yet. This stuff doesn't show up in high school textbooks yet. It doesn't show up in college textbooks yet. It will eventually. I'm hoping to see it in my lifetime. And maybe it'll lead to a humbler appreciation for the fragility of human life and stop projecting our, our 19th century and early 20th century militaristic prejudices back onto the past. Okay? I can give you many more examples of this kind of projection. Okay? Because history is more often than not about the present than about the past. That doesn't mean that I don't believe that historical knowledge is possible. Students always get upset at me at ILIF. 
you know. But it, again, I believe that historical knowledge, historical wisdom is possible, but we need to be very, very careful about how we project our prejudices onto the past. And the past had its own prejudices. It's hard enough trying to recover their stories and their identities, you know, um, because they have their own prejudices and their own levels of ignorance. But sometimes they actually are wiser than we modern people think we are, okay? Which is another one of the great fallacies that we're the best that there has ever been. Absolutely false. We may have a lot of toys, you know? We may have a lot of toys, but we're not necessarily better <laughs> or more compassionate or more humane. So, sorry, I'm starting to preach and moralize. <laughs> so anyway, you get the picture. Uh, I saw a hand up. I'll take one question, and then we'll do Q&A after the break. I just, I just, I just a quick question. Adam, yes. You talked earlier about how uh, history and our study of history reflects where we currently are. As these, these theories and ideas come up of that it may have been an ecological, is that possibly reflective now that we look at uh, climate crisis, as we look at those things that we're now using that to look back and go, oh, wait a minute. Now that we see, as we look at Yellowstone and super volcanoes and the existence of those and, and the devastation it had, that we are then now looking at, at other ways and, and other stories that have been a blind spot. Yes and no. Okay. Yes for a generation like me, who like to cast our net very widely. No for the historians who have, are overly specialized and don't want to look a little, a little wider afield. Uh, I'm a product of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary training. Not everyone goes to history programs that do that. Some overly specialize and may, may end up writing books that are tunnel vision books. But I often use their studies to gain knowledge, let's say, of what happened between 1250 and 1285 in Italy. I don't write that kind of stuff. I want to cover a big chunk and I, I follow the Annals approach of the French Annals school. Uh, and and, and that, that school of historiography tried to cast its net as widely as possible by looking at ecological history, um, agricultural history, climate, economics, politics, art, architecture, and things of that sort. Uh, I think the Annals approach is, 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 is uh, it's been around since the 1940s. And it was Fernand Braudel, the founder of the school, who was very fond of saying history is about the present, not about the past. So when I say things like that, I'm quoting him. Um, yeah. Uh, we also used to write the history of the world by writing the history of politics and of empires and of kingdoms. That doesn't get at the real people, you know? I mean, the age of Napoleon is a farce. <laughs> sure, he stirred up trouble. Sure, there were people who glorified him, but understanding Napoleon's policies isn't going to help us understand the incidents of tuberculosis and smallpox and yellow fever that ravaged the European world and the colonies at the very time that Napoleon is on his imperial adventures. See what I'm getting at? Um, so much wood was cut down. So many trees were cut down in medieval Europe to make the great Gothic cathedrals and to build the great medieval towns that became the great medieval and modern cities that we believe it caused a, a climate and ecological disaster. Um, we have monks that, would, that, that, that show us drawings of a hill filled with lush, beautiful trees in Germany or in France or in Italy, and the same hill is drawn 50 years later, and there's not a single tree left on the hill, and just the stumps, and you can even see the, the erosion of the, of the dirt around the trees. Um, and then what do we know happens in the 1300s, right before the Black Death? A massive ecological disaster, okay? Drought, famine, lack of rain, um, fields that were apparently infertile for the first time ever. So the system was already stressed in 1347 when the Black Death arrived in Europe. And some of us are now saying, well, the system was already stressed. The ecological system, the geological system, no, the ecological and climatological system was already distressed in 2019 
uh, but about the time that COVID-19 began spreading from China into Italy and into New York City, which are the three epicenters in succession. Wuhan, China, Milan, Italy, New York City, um, and then pff, the rest of the planet. So yeah, that, uh, you know, we need to take climate history more seriously. We need to take ecological history more seriously. Um, but, you know, some of the history departments and the different universities are still trapped in their really largely 19th and 20th century models of historical research. And they just need to figure out ways to cast their nets a little, a little more widely, as I say. Um, and, 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 and it'll lead to better historical knowledge. I, I really believe it will. Uh, even though it won't solve the problems of the present, it might raise consciousness enough that people will say, oh, wow, yeah, <laughs> climate does matter. <laughs> and what we do to the earth really is going to come back to haunt us at some point. Um, so anyway, yeah, thank you for that. So uh, before we take our break, let me just uh, get into a few, a few more things here. Where is that from? Game of, Game of Thrones. Okay. Yeah, this is Daenerys Targaryen, and I forgot the other character's name. Uh, Tyrion. 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 Tyrion, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, she would earn the nickname Mother of Dragons because these, these dragon eggs that have not hatched in a thousand years, okay, uh, the dragons have been gone for a thousand years, and no one seems to understand how these eggs could even, could even be made. They, they don't even believe these eggs are alive. And somehow she figures out a way to romance the eggs. Notice I'm playing with you here. To romance the eggs? you know, uh, to conjure the eggs, to conjure something, uh, and the eggs begin to hatch. And they're adorable at first, uh, even though they can burn you. But then as they grow, you realize how incredibly powerful and fierce they are. Okay? This is a positive view, in a way, of dragons. Medieval Christianity, medieval Europe, did not view the dragons as a positive thing. They viewed them purely as monsters. There are no medieval stories or mythologies of friendly dragons. Okay? Those are Hollywood inventions. And probably the myth of the medieval dragon goes way back to the beginnings of the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages. Okay? When supposedly our Danish and Germanic and Scottish and Welsh and, oh gosh, you name it, Anglo-Saxon, okay, Celtic, ancestors uh, had these legends that they would tell of great warriors who slayed monsters in order to protect the village, in order to protect the people. Okay, So the medieval European dragon is a monster, it lives in a cave, and it doesn't live a full life. It's not a creature of abundance. It's not a creature of compassion. It's not a creature that represents the raw mystery and magic and power of nature. On the contrary, it lives in a cave and it hoards things. The medieval dragon's nickname, and I'll end on this and we'll take a break and then we'll finish this after the break. The medieval dragon's nickname was hold fast. Hold fast. That's in Old English. Hold fast. One word. Hold fast. And that was a way of designating that the dragon was greedy, that the dragon was a monstrous hoarder. And what does the dragon hoard? Gold? Jewelry? Any? That, that's how Tolkien represented exactly. Like exactly. It was the greed of the dwarves that brought smog. Exactly. To them. Yes. And what else do medieval dragons love to capture? You see one right here, maidens, okay? But you gotta wonder, does the maiden really symbolize a maiden? Or does the maiden symbolize something else? And we'll talk about that after the break. 
And does the knight on a white horse really symbolize a knight on a white horse? Or does the knight on a white horse symbolize something deeper, something more primordial in, in, in human beings? Or in the mythology of our medieval European ancestors, a mythology that maybe we have forgotten or maybe we haven't forgotten it completely because on a subconscious level, the dragons in Game of Thrones, to some people, are the real heroes of the story. Not to everyone, but to some people they are. Do you see, Do you see how this plays out? Okay, so this is St. George slaying the dragon, the most famous medieval saint, St. George the dragon slayer, also very famous in the Muslim world as Al-Hadr, and also very famous in the far eastern world of the Persian Empire, also as Al-Hadr. Interesting, huh? Interesting. Didn't think that the Muslim medieval Islam got, also, got interested in this kind of stuff too. Yep. And, in, and, and whether it's Al-Hadr or the European St. George, they are protectors and defenders of all that is good and they are even associated with agriculture. Their sacred color is often green, even though they may appear on a white horse. And clearly here he is, uh, St. George is liberating this maiden, presumably from a cave. And I don't know, but in a way the dragon, the dragon doesn't have a chance here. I mean, come on, Raphael. This is a painting from the Renaissance by Raphael. And I'd be like, Raphael, honestly, couldn't you make the dragon a little bit bigger? I mean, come on. You know, I'm just playing with you. The dragons are so much bigger now, right? I mean, <laughs> they're huge, huge. Okay. Um, and, and the fact that the dragon spewed fire would eventually be very symbolic for Christians because they would eventually identify the dragon with d the devil and with uh, the monstrosities that come up from the lower regions of hell. And that the dragon lived in a cave, according to the pre-Christian mythology, lends itself very well to associating that dragon with Satan, because caves are doorways into the bowels of the earth. And hell, in medieval symbolism and literature and iconography, was often described as the bowels of Satan. Okay? There you have a little bit of this. This is only the beginning. We have a little bit more. Uh, I doubt that there were ever, well, let me not say too much more. I think we've said enough. It's 731. Let's take a 10 minute break and I will see you and we'll start with Q&A and then we'll see some more images of dragons and, and warrior queens. <laughs> um, yes, go ahead. No, actually, uh, one of them is Krakatoa in the Pacific Ocean. The last time it blew its top was in uh, the 1870s. And the following year, and I think the year after, are known as the years without summer in modern climate history. I, I want to say 1871, but don't quote me on that. Um, Krakatoa can change the climate of the planet when the eruption is large enough. And there have been several eruptions of Krakatoa going back hundreds of thousands, even millions of years that have done huge damage on the planet. The other two, uh, one I believe is in uh, Northern Europe and the other one is uh, in Central Europe. I don't know the names of the other two because I just found this out yesterday. Uh, <laughs> seriously, I just found this out yesterday. That's how recent this knowledge is. I am aware of the ice core samples that were taken in the Arctic and in the Antarctic back in the late 1990s and early 2000s, which found that, at, again, the event horizon of the year 535 to 538 showed an increase in iridium all over the planet, and that is usually the signature of a supervolcano. Um, and everyone thought it was Krakatoa, but now there are two additional volcanoes believed to have also erupted within the same four to five year period. And, uh, you know, three of those, whew, 
That, that can really mess with the climate of the planet. Um, and, and, and there are other, other cultures that existed on the planet at that time that recorded the sky being cloudy for, you know, one chronicle says the sky was cloudy for 18 months. And others say the moon did not shine and the sun appeared um, obscured for months and months and months and months. And then you know what else happens after that? There's acid rain, uh, which further kills off the crops from the volcanic chemicals that then fall back to earth uh, from clouds that are contaminated by that kind of thing. So yeah, thank you for asking that. Uh, yeah, amazing, really amazing. Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, I favor St. Michael over St. George as a dragon star. Yes. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I like them both. Um, St. George is, is the older tradition, uh, probably based on a pagan monster slayer or dragon slayer, a pre-Christian dragon slayer, which then is Christianized. Probably St. George existed, and he was a famous knight from the early Middle Ages. <coughs> St. Michael, the imagery, the iconography of St. Michael and the stories of St. Michael are very biblical because it is Michael who wages war against Satan, and it is Michael who guards the gates of paradise, and it is Michael who will defeat Satan at the end of time, after Armageddon, on the Day of Judgment. And so Christianity, as it spread across Europe, I think because St. George was so connected to pagan agricultural and healing traditions, Christianity began favoring St. Michael as the ultimate Christian superhero, or the ultimate Christian dragon slayer. And, and the dragon that St. Michael battles is almost always considered a representation of either a demon or of Satan himself. Yes? Isn't is St. George, he's sort of the patron saint of Jerusalem, right? I mean, that was another reason for Yeah, except that when you consider that St. George and Hodder, St. George and St. Hodder probably go back to prehistoric times, uh, we're dealing with an older oral tradition that is inseparable from agriculture and from the kind, of, uh, the kind of agency that protected crops um, from all sorts of superstitious and natural disasters. So if you, if you leave Europe and you do go to the Levant, to the Middle East, you realize that, yes, there is this tradition of St. George that aligns him with Jerusalem, but it goes back probably to prehistoric times before anyone was even called St. George and before anyone was even called St. Al-Hadr. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, uh, it shows us that myths are, are a lot older than we often think, but it shows us that every new generation can also add to the mythology of a much older story and by adding to it, actually make it richer. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And so St. George also passes by way of the Holy Land, also passes into the iconography of the Byzantine Empire. He's very, very big in Eastern Christianity. Um, yeah. Um, other, I saw a few other hands up. Did you have your hand up? Thank you. Yes. Um, Ken Follett wrote a couple novels set in the Middle mm. East. Yeah, beautiful. Do you think they were accurate? Yes, the they are fantastic. I've used them to teach medieval architecture. I've used them to teach medieval culture. Um, and the whole inspiration for the Gothic enterprise. Um, yes, they are accurate. I would not describe them as medievalism. I would describe them as historical novels. What is the name of the Ken name? Follett, The Pillars of the Earth. Yeah, what's the new one? Oh, what is the new one? Morning and evening. Yeah. I'm so glad you asked that. I was asking over break. 
<laughs> yes. And there's also a, a very uh, popular Hollywood version of, of the novel, of The Pillars of the Earth. Yeah. It does a great job also of portraying the competition among the monastic orders, um, which, which, which was very much a part of medieval culture. And that competition was good. It had economic uh, benefits to it. Um, yes. Yeah, unfortunately, that's not my area of expertise, but I am interested in it, and I'll tell you why. The question uh, is about the uh, pre-Columbian, as they say, the Mesoamerican civilizations of the Incas, the Mayans, the Olmecs, and so forth. I'm fascinated by those stories, in part because I specialize in the Spanish Empire and in the legacies of Spanish colonialism. Um, if 1492 had not happened, I would have been very happy, even though, again, I don't get paid to what-if history. I get paid to remember history. Um, my ancestors believed that uh, that civilization was inferior and was worthy of being conquered. And in the, con in the process of conquest, they burned their books. And so now we know almost nothing about them that we need to know. Um, I also believe that those civilizations are probably older than we think. We know the Teotihuacan, which is usually ascribed as a Mayan site or an Olmec site, may actually be thousands and thousands of years older than the archaeologists currently believe. Um, when the Spaniards were in the process of conquering the Inca Empire in South America, there were ruins that they rode past. And the conquistadors asked the, the native guides, who built that? What is that? And some of the native guides said, no one knows who built that. That was here long before any of us. So uh, I believe that the, the history books on all of these pre-conquest, pre-colonization civilizations uh, is still out. The verdict is still out. We keep finding sites that are pushing the dates back further and further and further and further. Um, it is possible that some of the dates go back 14,000 to 22,000 years. Okay, not as advanced yet as the Incas and the Mayans and the Aztecs were, but it shows us that there was an entire history of humanity uh, in the Western Hemisphere that again, the founders of the modern historical profession chose to either denigrate or write out of the historical record. There was a climate, uh, God, environmental determinism was one of the historiographic theories of the late 1800s and early 1900s. And that historic, that, that environmental determinism said that in the history of humanity, the civilizations that lived in more northern and cooler climates were superior to those that lived in southern and warmer climates, which is absolutely absurd because everyone knows that when it's summer here, it's what in South America? Amazing, amazing hubris. Um, and also the fact that they were not Christian civilizations, just like what happened to Marco Polo after he returned from China. The conquistadors and all of the other colonists had reasons for why they wanted to denigrate the accomplishments and the achievements of those societies. Um, more than that, I can't really tell you. Um, I'm not an expert in Mayan or Aztec or Inca uh, history, but I am, I am keeping a one eye on the archaeology, on the archaeology of Central and South America, because I believe that we have the history of the human race wrong. I really believe we've got it wrong. I really believe that um, one day we're going we're gonna to figure out what existed before the end of the last ice age, and I think we're going to be surprised. We're going to be surprised that our ancestors did not crawl out of caves like dirty animals uh, 12,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, and we're going to have to rethink the history, uh, the origins of human civilization. We keep finding sites that are pushing the records back, back, back. Back, And I don't mean just a few thousand years back, I mean 7,000 years back, 14,000 years back, 15,000 years back. 
with really sophisticated mathematics that charted the celestial objects, uh, which of course you need for agriculture and you need to be able to tell the seasons. Um, so anyway, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not giving little green men from outer space the credit for any of this, okay? I don't play in that game, but there are ancient artifacts and structures that we still do not understand how they could possibly have been made by cavemen and cavewomen. We simply do not understand, which means that's an anomaly, and it's either that the theory is wrong or the archaeology is wrong, and it has to be the theory. So does that help a little bit? Yeah. Yes? Let's get back to dragons. Sure. But I'm interested in, uh, let's go back to Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. Those dragons weren't so bad until the mother of the dragons kind of replaced them. Yeah, I don't want to get into that one yet. <laughs> but I'm going there tonight, I promise, before okay. we break. Fine. That's the great disappointment of Game of Thrones. Did I tell you my kids signed a petition to have <laughs> season eight refilmed, redone? Millions of people were disappointed by how Daenerys Targaryen becomes this homicidal maniac. I'll, I'll talk about. I think to be fair, it's fair. If y'all need to know, like George R. R. Martin had not finished, and still has not finished the final novel, and so when season eight was being made, he was there and consulting. But I think that's why fans are disappointed, especially guys like me that have read the books. That's not at all how the Targaryens were portrayed in the books, and that's why we're mad because we want the book. Yes. Right. And, and yes. We feel like that they just made it up. But a lot, of, a lot of women of all ages were disappointed yeah. because the medieval world demonizes women for all sorts of reasons. And to have a modern medievalism that was so progressive until those final few episodes, I got to be honest with you, even at ILIF I had students, female students, who were just devastated well, that a team of male producers... And, and, and to be fair, I mean, like, you watch it again, you have to watch the series two or three times. Yeah. Oh, yes. No, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you. But if, if, but if popular culture, if popular culture is also a place where we work out our visions of who we might become, of what we might become, by misusing the past and retelling the past in a very modern way, and that's not a bad thing, okay, then, then to go back to the old medieval notion of female rulers being poisoned by excessive force as a compensation for their femininity and that they're not physically as strong as the men, I got to be honest with you. I think it was time to break out of that mold. And that series and the novels could have done it beautifully, and uh, George R. R. Martin may still have the last laugh on the world. <laughs> so again, as the father of two young women who were really into Game of Thrones, <laughs> and two sons who were really into Game of Thrones, um, that, was not a, that, that was not a good eighth season at home. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know. <laughs> well, I've, got, I've got three daughters too. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> But, but their mother and I, my ex, actually said to them, you do realize that there were signs all along that she was going to snap. <laughs> and she did have some real anger issues at several points in the previous seven seasons. You know. Well, it's interesting you talk about how the, the, the compensation, right? It, it, I think this is the trope, right? It, even in the 21st century that we make females feel like they have to compensate. Yes. 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 So to kind of legitimize that with this popular culture notion that it looks good on the screen, right? It kind of further exactly. exacerbates yep. that feeling. And you even see that in the way that we critique female leaders, whether they're running for office or whether they end up in office. 
But the higher up the power grid the woman climbs, the greater, all these pre the greater likelihood of all these prejudices coming out. And it can be something as innocuous as, gee, she's not feminine enough. She's not feminine enough. Or it could be something much more sinister like, wow, why is she so aggressive? <laughs> you know. Um, and, but, but historians, modern historians, and ancient chroniclers, the things that they wrote about female rulers are horrific. You know. Basically, female medieval rulers are associated with bloodbaths whenever they are charged with leading an army into battle. Whether they show up on the battlefield in armor or not, it's because they gave the orders. And maybe they used too much force, too much aggressiveness, too much violence, because they knew that if they got captured, they were done for. So I'm thinking of Princess Olga, okay, a very famous Russian ruler from the early Middle Ages. Um, and others, too, others from the Middle Ages. You know, there's a... Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great. Yes, or even Elizabeth the Great of England. I mean, the way the Spaniards demonized her, you know. I mean, really, think about that. She really did have the guts to show up in armor on the battlefield before the Spanish Armada attempted to encircle England. And, of course, it was a rousing speech to, you know, um, rally the people. Again, remember, the speech has been embellished, right, by historians, by, by chroniclers, uh, embellished. But still, nonetheless, she was a pretty tough cookie in an incredibly male-dominated world. And what are one of the ways that she fought off the domination? Refusing to do what? Yeah. Exactly. And for that, they tormented her constantly, constantly. Um, so, you know... Uh, I do believe that our fascination with medievalism is one of the convergent sites where we are working out certain things about our own modern identities. This also happens in science fiction movies and in science fiction literature. One day, one day we're going to be as sophisticated and as evolved as those people in Star Wars in the 23rd century. No, excuse me, I meant Star Trek in the 23rd century. Okay, when the earth has come together um, and, you know, the, 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 the unification of the human race. So, so really think about that. Uh, you know, Star Wars plays similar um, elements of consciousness, of awareness. And the same was true in the Middle Ages. Okay, it's just that we have to study it a little bit harder because we're not medieval people. But it is possible that the dragon simply represents our darker side, the darker side of our human nature. You can become a dragon easily, you know. You can refuse to live. You can refuse to thrive. You can, be, you can become a hoarder. And I don't mean a, a, a hoarder that is mentally ill. A hoarder who is a hoarder because of mental health issues. I mean a hoarder who is a hoarder because you're greedy. <coughs> because of your avarice, because you want to control the women in your family. You want to even decide who they can marry and who they cannot marry. You see what I'm getting at? Don't forget, it's not that long ago that in the United States a woman could not have a credit card. All right? That's yesterday. My God, I was a boy when my mother was still going through that kind of thing after she divorced my father. Or a license. Exactly. Or appear in court without a male voice to represent her. So there is something about popular culture, whether it's medievalism or science fiction or other forms of fantasy, that are not so fantasy-laden. It's almost as if there's ways that we're trying to think about our fuller humanity. And so the dragon in many ways in the Middle Ages represented all those things that were holding us back. And the knight on a white horse in shining armor perhaps represents that part of us, male or female, that is willing to say, no, I'm going to fight these systems of control. I'm going to fight these things. I'm going to fight them, fight them, fight them. By the grace of God, perhaps. 
And what does the maiden represent? Maybe the human soul in all of its wonder and all of its potential. Try not to use the word purity because, you know, we essentialize medieval women that way. It's a whole nother, that's a subject for a whole nother debate, a whole nother class, you know. But think about that. Maybe this is a model of human psychological transformation and maybe even of spiritual transformation if you want to play the same game with Michael, St. Michael slaying the dragon, in which case Satan then represents what Satan has always represented in Jewish and in Christian literature, the prince of darkness, the master of lies, God's enemy. I don't think that way of Satan, but that's, again, that's a subject for another time and another place. And I think I did present here on Satan many years ago. Um, yes, go ahead, and then we'll come back to the front. Um, just on dragons, and you saying that there's always some truth or whatever, what animal is the dragon for real? Like, like in China, people say, well, it's probably a kimono dragon, but they, of course, created the dragon initially, right? In England, what, is it, what animal did they base everything? Um, Pre-Christian mythology already is talking about and, and, and singing about and composing poetry about mythological gigantic snakes, um, you know, lizards. Um, the Chinese and Japanese versions of the dragon are very different. They're symbols of life, symbols of fertility, symbols of the awesome power of nature. In the European context, from that pre-Christian, early medieval, and maybe even prehistoric traditions, we get a very different kind of dragon. But I think Christianity problematizes the dragon even further by connecting the dragon to demons and to Satan in ways that our own Celtic ancestors, my family is Celtic from the north of Spain, uh, our own Celtic ancestors would, would never have gone there. Um, Celtic Christianity, though, does have dragons in it. Does have dragons in it. And we are told that St. Patrick freed Ireland of snakes. snakes. Okay, yes. Oh, and I'll get back to you. I'm sorry. In, in all those cultures, also, they're finding dinosaur bones that maybe could explain that. Excellent. Excellent. Caesar Octavius Augustus was fascinated by prehistoric bones of mammoths and of dinosaurs. And there may be something to that, that, that popular mythology and the conceptions in the late ancient world and in the early medieval world of a time when there were monsters on earth. And if, that, and if that was true then, then why couldn't it be true now? After all, there is a monster that lives in that infamous lake known as Loch Ness. Um, so, or monsters that live in caves. Um, so think about this. There's a way of writing a medieval psychology of human transformation through the symbolism of what a dragon and a maiden and a knight in shining armor on a white horse might represent. Crystal clear to you and me, but not so crystal clear to them. Those of you who like to analyze Star Wars or Star Trek or other science fiction that is on television, a hundred years from now, two hundred years from now, three hundred years from now, the pop culture historians will have to go out of their way to understand what you and I can talk about tonight like, like nothing. Because our own unexamined assumptions maybe are closer to our own consciousness and 200 years from now or 300 years from now, they'll have to dig for it, literally dig for it in the book, in the whatever survives. I mean, you know, maybe it'll be hard to study us because our culture is so fragile, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know what I mean? Technology, tech is fragile, whereas books can survive in ways that tech cannot. Yes, go ahead. You had a question. Oh, actually, it's about the knight in shining armor. I think a lot of women through history, my mother is one, was always waiting for the knight in shining armor. And I think women were fed that, you know, 40 to the, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, I think they were waiting, she was waiting for that. Yes, in and the... It was from, back from then, 
Yes, yeah. but maybe it was from Romantic medievalism that your ancestors learned in the 1830s and beyond. I know my mother would often talk about un caballero uh, en, en armario, meaning a, a knight in, in armor. Um, she often used it in a romantic way and she often used it in a sarcastic way. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, you can also talk about a knight in rusty armor. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there's actually a book about that, The Knight in Rusty Armor. It's, it's about, it's about, I don't know. No, actually, it's a modern day fable. A modern day fable that tries to get at the flaws in that vision of masculinity. And the flaws in a woman who overly identifies with that vision of masculinity. And that if she would recognize that her knight is a knight in rusty armor, she might be able to recover the humanity of her partner and vice versa. Because the dehumanization goes both ways. And maybe dehumanization isn't even the right word. The fetishizing of the other goes both ways. So that is one of the unfortunate legacies of romantic medievalism, but it may also be one of the unfortunate legacies of medieval chivalry. Because our notions of modern love, okay, I mean this, our notions of modern love come out of medieval literature, out of medieval songs, out of medieval iconography. Modern day marriage ceremonies, unless you revamp them for yourself, are basically medieval ceremonies. Um, yeah, Love in the Western World by Denis de Rougemont is the most famous history book ever written about how the origins of modern love and of modern relationships as being a union of souls, soul mates, you can get really carried away with that. Fair warning, right? See, you're smiling, you know it. Um, that dates to the Middle Ages. In the troubadours who sang about falling in love when the eyes of the, of, of the lovers met. Uh, makes for great literature, um, probably makes for catastrophes in personal relationships. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I want to say a little bit more. I have a few more images and I want to be mindful of our time because it's 8.12. Uh, I have a very long day tomorrow so I'm not going to linger today at the end of class. Um, normally I don't mind, but I just want to warn you that I do need to move on because of the length of my day tomorrow. Get a load of this. Yeah, some people want to wear their medievalism. Okay, this is actually a very popular tattoo all over the world. Okay, and this is St. George, I mean, excuse me, St. Michael. Yeah. Okay, this is St. Michael. But the dragon is green. Yes. Yes, again, I don't know where the tattoo artist got this idea from. In the Middle Ages, this would probably be somewhat offensive because green is the color of the Holy Spirit and of the rebirth of nature and of the Earth Mother in medieval iconography. But this tattoo artist probably knows nothing about the Middle Ages. Um, yeah. How do you know which saint it is? It's my intuition. It's just my sense of intuition. The, 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 the head is the head of an idealized angel. The, again, the tattoo artist probably got this from an angelology book. Uh, remember that the tattoo artist probably has this image copyrighted in a way. Um, this has nothing to do with Christian symbolism or even with traditional medieval iconography. I can assure you that uh, green is not the color of a medieval dragon. I just told you what green is. There's even a medieval Latin phrase for the coming of the Holy Spirit in year in spring, and it's viriditas, which literally means greening, greening. So, you know, green is also the color of the Lady of the Lake in the Arthurian tradition. Um, again, this means nothing to me as a historian. I just want you to see a real living example of the extremes to which people go to in popular culture. Um, nothing wrong with that, by the way. I'm probably going to get some medieval tattoos eventually myself. <laughs> but not that dramatic. <laughs> well, I resent the fact that the halo's long, too. Why? Because I'm not. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I, I blonde so pure, I guess. 
We'll talk about that eventually. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, it's related to modern nationalism and modern racialization. Uh, when all of these medieval knights are portrayed as being these dashing, blonde, blue-eyed or green-eyed young men. Um, yeah, it actually has a lot to do with what happened in Germany from 1870 to 1945. And it's also making a comeback now among American uh, neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups. Um, here is another image. This one is St. George and the Dragon. Okay. Um, this one is from the uh, 1700s. And the cape is almost always red to symbolize the passion of Christ and uh, the church. Uh, and you can see that in this case, he is defending the church. See the statue of the Virgin Mary? Um, and the church building behind it. And here is a Byzantine icon of St. George and the Dragon. Again, notice defending the church and what appears to be an image of, of the Blessed Mother or of the, 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 the Virgin Mary. Okay. This is a modern day icon, by the way, but based on, on older. And you can see that the dragon came out of, a, of a, out of a hole in the ground. Maybe it came out of the bowels of hell. And it looks very lizard-like, very demonic. Yes, All, well, almost always, yeah. Is there a reason the tails matter? No, I don't know the answer to that. That must be a Byzantine tradition that I am unaware of. I don't think it has a religious meaning. And then, of course, back to Game of Thrones. <laughs> and there's a few more. Ah, Mother of Dragons. These were really incredible, incredible, uh, innovative examples of medievalism, in my opinion. So it's interesting with Targaryens and the books and their movies. One of the characters, like y'all were talking about blonde hair, one of the marks of a, one of the genetic markers of a Targaryen was white hair and pale skin. So. Yes, and that is a marker in several ancient cultures of having been blessed by the divine or of having encountered the divine. Your hair turns white and your skin turns very pale. And the Roman emperors would often appear in public in very, very thick white makeup uh, with a halo, uh, actually a golden plate positioned in the back of their, of their, of their uh, uh, dress for the day but in super, super white, ridiculously excessive, caked on makeup. And it was the way, their way of portraying the genius of the emperor, meaning the idea that in the emperor's body, there was a divinity incarnated. And that divinity really was, the genius means a higher self, higher soul, or advanced soul. Yeah, there are, there are historical parallels to a lot of this. Um, I mean, clearly Daenerys here had, had just survived uh, uh, well, she doesn't die either. No, that's how she, that's how they're born. Yeah. So the, in the movie, and it sort of was in the book, um, there's a witch, and the witch takes her husband as a sacrifice and makes long things. But anyway, the way the dragon eggs are born is that Daenerys takes the witch, and she burns her on a pyre with the eggs and herself. And so the witch's sacrifice is the magic that's released that hatches the eggs. Yeah. And so that's another mark of a true Targaryen is that they can't be burned. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, unburnt. So if you're a pure and true Targaryen, you can't be burned by fire. Yeah. And there are medieval precedents for that. <clears throat> the alchemists of the Middle Ages believed that there was a mythical bird known as the phoenix and that the phoenix was uh, um, analogous to the nature of Christ. 
because the phoenix would rise from the ashes in the same way that Christ rose from the tomb. Um, so there are medieval precedents for some of this, but the medieval alchemical phoenix has nothing to do with, with these dragons. Um, and, you know, again, that's, that's part of the adventure of all of this. You don't have to follow the old models. You can take the old models and throw them in the garbage and start from scratch. And maybe that is even greater artistry because maybe in abandoning the past, the patterns, right? The patterns from the past, maybe you can tell a better story for a new time and a new place. Maybe. Um, this is a drawing, right? Uh, again, this means nothing. I just got it randomly off the internet. It's, it just means nothing. Anyway, all right, so you get the, you get the picture, you get the idea. Um, next week, we're going to talk about the Arthurian tradition, but also about the use and abuse of medieval history, of, medieval, of medievalism among white supremacist groups and neo-Nazi groups. Uh, which I find very alarming, but it's not new at all. We've been doing that for almost 200 years, um, uh, longer than 200 years. And believe it or not, Hitler's favorite stories were medieval stories of the Templar Knights and of dragon slayers. Okay? And uh, many of the highest ranking Nazis were members of German Grail societies of German knight, knighthood societies. And the SS, the SS is modeled on the Templar Knights. The first organization that became the Nazi SS was the OMT, which literally means Ordo Novis Templis, the New Templar Order. Okay? And just so you... Oh, sorry about that. Just so that you know that Hollywood also took a shot at this, there is Indiana Jones confronting Adolf Hitler at one of the rallies, one of the Nazi rallies in the late 30s. And they bump into each other by accident. But Hitler is so full of himself that he thinks what Indy wants is a signature, is an autograph. And, and Indy is really worried that he, that's his nickname, that's his father's nickname. And he gets really upset at his father saying, don't call me Indy. Okay? Some of you probably haven't seen the movie because you're not smiling very much. Okay. <laughs> uh, I believe it came out in 1989. Um, and and so, so, so Hitler, the Nazis want the Grail Diary. Indiana Jones Sr., played by Sean Connery, um, is, a, is a Grail expert, scholar, historian, archaeologist, literary expert, and he's been keeping a Grail Diary throughout his career. And the Grail Diary is a map to the real Grail. So the Nazis want it. And, and here, Indy, Indiana Jones Jr., runs into Hitler. And I love this. Do you know why? Because when Hitler goes like this and, and, and says, OK, I'll give you my autograph, and Indy gives him the Grail Diary, to me, that was a chilling moment. Because Hitler really did live his, leave his signature in the history of the Holy Grail. He really and truly did. There was an elite unit of SS officers sent all over Europe to look for the Grail because Hitler and the SS command and some of the highest ranking Nazis believed that if they could find that object and show it to the world, they might be able to use it for some very good propaganda purposes and maybe even convince more people to join the movement and to follow them to victory. <laughs> what do you think of that? Chilling, isn't it? And Fuhrer means vessel. So when Hitler says in his frenzy, I am the spirit of the German people, he's referring to himself as literally the vessel. Sick, sick, sick. Idolatry. Yeah, yeah. And so Dan Brown 
And the way he retells the story is just part of this long, long tradition of a new generation of writers taking the old tradition and trying to retell it for a new time and a new place. But this really did happen, by the way. The Nazis really did search for the grail all over Europe. True story. True story. I'll talk more about that next week. It's pretty disturbing, actually. And here we are in 2021. We saw a lot of uh, misguided, white supremacist, neo-Nazi-oriented fellow Americans storming the Capitol on January 6th with some of their banners and their shields. And we saw it also a few years ago at the, the rallies at the University of Virginia, you know, Charlottesville. Uh, there they were even more blatantly neo-Nazi and white supremacist. Um, anyway, sorry to end on a negative note, but you see medievalism can be a convergent site for ways in which we're rethinking our identities and ways in which we are rethinking masculinity, femininity, church-state relations, all kinds of things, even magic, okay, mysticism. But medievalism can also be a site in which we look for the glorious origins of European civilization, the glorious origins of our race in a long forgotten time that really didn't exist historically. If the Templar, well, again, let me not use up my material for next week. If the Templars were around today, they would be very bothered by the neo-Nazi movement and the white supremacists, I assure you. And in a way, they still are with us. The Templars have survived in the Masonic order and in the uh, uh, House of the Holy Spirit, known as the Rosicrucian order. All right. Any, well, thank you. I think maybe we should honor our time and call it a night. Thank you very much. Thank you.